by Ted Garvin. Amadis of Gaul by Vasco de Lobera. Translated by Robert Salvi. Book 2, Chapter 1. Here beginneth the second book of Amadis of Gaul, and because the great things which will be related in the fourth book concerning Amadis are all relating to the firm island, it behooves that in this second it should be related what this island was, and who left those enchantments and the great riches which were therein. There was a king in Greece married to the sister of the emperor of Constantinople, by whom he had two fair sons, especially the elder named Apollidon, who in his days had no equal for strength of body and courage of heart. He having a subtle genius, which is so seldom found with valor, gave himself to the study of the sciences and of all arts, so that he shone among those of his own time like the moon among the stars. Especially he excelled in necromancy, whereby things that appear impossible are done. The king his father was very rich in treasure, but poor in life by reason of his great age, and seeing himself at the point of death, he commanded that the kingdom should be given to Apollodon, as his eldest son, and his books and treasures to the other. The younger was not contented with this, and told his father so with tears, and complained that he was disinherited. But the old man, not knowing what to do, wrung his hands for pure sorrow. Then that famous Apollodon, seeing his father's grief and the littleness of his brother, bade him take comfort, for he would accept the books and treasure, and relinquish the kingdom to his brother, whereat the father gave him his blessing with many tears. So Apollodon took his inheritance, and fitted out certain ships, manning them with chosen knights, and set forth into the sea, trusting himself to fortune, who, seeing his great obedience to his father, and how he had thrown himself upon her mercy, resolved to requite him with glory and greatness. A fair wind carried him to the empire of Rome, where Suodan was then emperor, at whose court he abode some time, doing great feats in arms, till there grew a true affection between him and the emperor's sister, Grimanessa, who then flourished among all other women for beauty. So it was that he was loving, even so was he loved, and as their loves might no other ways be indulged, they left Rome together and set sail in Apollodon's fleet, and sailed till they came to the firm island. There Apollodon landed, not knowing what country it was, and pitched a tent upon the shore, and placed a couch there for his lady who was weary of the sea. Presently there came down a fierce giant, who was lord of the island, with whom, according to the custom of the place, Apollodon was to do battle for the preservation of his lady and himself, and his company. It ended in such sort that the giant lay dead on the field, and Apollodon remained master of the island. When he had seen its strength, he neither feared the emperor of Rome, whom he had offended, nor all the world besides. And there he and Grimanessa, being greatly loved, beloved by the, the islanders, whom he had delivered from their oppressor, dwelt in all happiness for sixteen years. During that time many rich edifices were made, as well with his great treasures as with his surpassing wisdom, such as it would have been difficult for any emperor or king, how rich soever, to have completed. At the end of that time the emperor of Greece died without an heir, and the Greeks, knowing the great worth of Apollodon, and that by his mother's side he was of the blood and lineage of the emperors, elected him with one common consent to rule over them. He, albeit he was enjoying all possible delights in his own island, yet with Grimanessa's consent accepted the empire. But she, before they left the island where she had enjoyed such rare happiness, requested her husband that he would work such a means by his great knowledge that that island might never be possessed, except by a knight as excellent in arms and loyal in love as himself, and by a dame resembling her in beauty and truth. Then Apollodon made an arch at the entrance of a garden, wherein there were all kinds of trees, and also four rich chambers, but it was so surrounded that none could enter, except by passing under the arch, over which he placed the image of a man made of copper, holding a trumpet in his mouth as if he would wind it, 
and in one of the chambers within he placed two figures in the likeness of himself and his lady, the countenances and the stature like unto them, so true that they seemed alive, and near them he placed a bright stone of jasper, and about half the distance of a crossbow shot he made a peron of iron. Henceforward, said he, no man or woman who hath been false to their first love shall pass here, for yonder image shall blow from that trumpet so dreadful a blast with smoke and flames of fire, that they shall be stunned and cast out as dead. But if knight or dame or damsel come, worthy by virtue of true loyalty to finish this adventure, they shall enter without let, and the image shall make a sound so sweet that it shall be delightful to hear, and they shall see our images, and behold their own name written in the jasper. Grimanessa afterwards ordered some of her knights and ladies to make trial, and then the image blew the dreadful blast with smoke and flames of fire, whereat Grimanessa laughed, knowing them to be in more dread than danger. But yet, my lord, quoth she, what shall be done with that rich chamber wherein we have enjoyed such great contentment? He answered, You shall see. Then he made two other perrons, one of stone, the other of copper. The stone one was placed five paces from the chamber, the copper one five paces farther off. Know now, said he, that henceforth in no manner, nor at any time, shall man or woman enter this chamber, till a knight come who surpasses me in prowess, or a woman exceeding you in beauty, they shall enter. He then placed these words in the copper perron. Knights shall advance here, each according to his valor, and in the stone peron he wrote, Here none shall pass except the knight who exceeds Apollodon in prowess. And over the door of the chamber he wrote, He who surpasses me in prowess shall enter here, and be lord of the island. And he laid such a spell, that none could approach within twelve paces of the chamber round about, nor was there any entrance but by the perons. Then he appointed a governor to rule the island, and collect the revenues, which were to be reserved for the knight who should enter the chamber. And he commanded that all who failed in attempting to pass the arch of lovers should, without ceremony, be cast out of the island. But such as passed through were to be entertained and served with all honor. And farther he appointed that all knights who attempted the adventure of the forbidden chamber and did not pass the copper peron should leave their arms there, but from those who advanced any way beyond it, only their swords should be taken. They who reached to the marble peron should leave only their shields, and if they penetrated beyond that, but failed to enter the chamber, they should lose only their spurs. From the dames and damsels who failed, nothing was to be taken, only their names should be placed upon the castle gate, and an account how far they had advanced. Apollodon then said, When this island shall have another lord, the enchantment shall be dissolved, and all knights may freely pass the perrons and enter the chamber, but it shall not be free for women till the fairest shall have come, and lodged in the rich chamber with the lord of the island. These enchantments being thus made, Apollodon and his wife entered their ships and passed over into Greece, where they reigned during their lives, and left children to succeed them. Chapter 2. How Amadis with his brethren and his cousin Agraez went toward King Lisuarte, and how by adventure they went to the enchanted firm island, and of what befell them there. While Amadis remained with his comrades at the court of Sobradisa, his thoughts were perpetually fixed upon his lady Oriana, and so thoughtful was he, and so often, both sleeping and waking, was he in tears that all saw how he was troubled, yet knew they not the cause, for he kept his love silent as a man who had all virtues in his heart. At length, not being able to support a longer absence, he asked permission of the fair young queen to depart, which she not without reluctance having granted, loving him better than herself, he and his brethren and their cousin Agraez took the road toward King Lisuarte. Some days had they traveled when they came to a little church, and entering there to say their prayers, they saw a fair damsel, accompanied by two others, 
and by four squires who guarded her, coming from the door. She asked them whither they went. Amadis answered, Damsel, we go to the court of King Lisuarte, where, if it please you to go, we will accompany you. Thank you, quoth the damsel, but I am faring elsewhere. I waited because I saw you were armed like errant knights, to know if any of you would go and see the wonders of the firm island, for I am the governor's daughter, and am returning there. Holy Mary, cried Amadis, I have often heard of the wonders of that island, and should account myself happy if I might prove them. Yet till now I never prepared to go. Good sir, quoth she, do not repent of your delay. Many have gone there with the same wish, and returned not so joyfully as they went. So I have heard, said Amadis, tell me, would it be far out of our road if we went there? Two days journey. Is the firm island then in this part of the sea, where is the enchanted arch of true lovers, under which neither man nor woman can pass that hath been false to their first love? The damsel answered, It is a certain truth, and many other wonders are there. Then Agraeus said to his companions, I know not what you will do, but I will go with this damsel and see these wonderful things. If you are so true a lover, said she, as to pass the enchanted arch, you will see the likenesses of Apollodon and Grimanisa, and behold your own name written upon a stone, where you will find only two names written besides, though the spell have been made a hundred years. In God's name let us go, quoth Agraeus, and I will try whether I can be third. With that Amadis, who in his heart had no less desire and faith to prove the adventure, said to his brethren, We are not enamoured, but we should keep our cousin company who is, and whose heart is so bold. Thereto they all consented, and setting, set forth with the damsel. What is this island? said Florestan to Amadis. Tell me, sir, for you seem to know. A young knight whom I greatly esteem, replied Amadis, told me all I know, King Arban of North Wales. He was there four days, but could accomplish none of the adventures, and so departed with shame. The damsel then related the history of the enchantments, which greatly incited Galaor and Florestan to the proof. So they rode on till sunset, and then entering the valley they saw many tents pitched in the meadow, and people sporting about them, and one knight, richly apparelled, who seemed to be the chief. Sirs, quoth the damsel, that is my father. I will go advertise him of your coming, that he may do you honor. When he heard of their desire to try the enchantment, he went on foot with all his company to welcome them, and they were honorably feasted and lodged that night. At morning they accompanied the governor to his castle, which commanded the whole island, for at the entrance there was a neck of land, only a bow shot over, connected with the mainland. All the rest was surrounded by the sea, seven leagues in length it was, and five broad. And because it was all surrounded by the sea, except where that neck of land connected it with the continent, it was called the Firm Island. Having entered, they saw a great palace, the gates whereof were open, and many shields hung upon the wall. About a hundred were in one row, and above them were ten, and above the ten were two, but one of them was in a higher niche than the other. Then Amadis asked why they were thus ranked. The governor answered, According to the prowess of those who would have entered the forbidden chamber, the shields of those who could not enter the peron of copper are near the ground. The ten above them are those who reached it. The lowest of the two passed that peron, and the one above all reached to the marble peron, but could pass no farther. Then Amadis approached the shields to see if he knew them, for each had its owner's name inscribed. The one which was the highest of the ten bore a sable lion, with argent teeth and nails, and a bloody mouth, in a field sable. This he knew to be the shield of Archelaus. Then he beheld the two uppermost. The lower bore, in a field azure, a knight cutting off the head of a giant. This was the shield of King Abes of Ireland, who had been there two years before his combat with Amadis. The highest had three golden flowers in a field azure. This he knew not, but he read the inscription. This is the shield of Don Quadragante, brother to King Abias of Ireland. 
He had proved the adventure twelve days ago, and had reached the marble perron, which was more than any knight before him had done, and he was now gone to Great Britain to combat Amadis in revenge for his brother's death. When Amadis saw all these shields, he doubted the adventure much, seeing that such knights had failed. They went out from the palace toward the arch of true lovers. When they came near, Agraeus alighted and commanded himself to God, and cried, Love, if I have been true to thee, remember me. And he passed the, sp the spell, and when he came under the arch, the image blew forth sweet sounds, and he came to the palace, and saw the likeness of Apollodon and Grimanissa, and saw also the jasper stone, wherein two names were written, and now his own the third. The first said, Madanil, son of the Duke of Burgundy, achieved this adventure. And the second was, This is the name of Don Bruneo of Bonamar, son of Valados, Marquis of Troc. And his own said, This is Agraeus, son to King Languines of Scotland. This Madanil loved Guinda, Lady of Flanders. Don Bruneo had proved the enchantment but eight days ago, and she whom he loved was Melicia, daughter to King Perion, the sister of Amadis. When Agraeus had thus entered, Amadis said to his brethren, Will you prove the adventure? No, said they, we are not so enthralled that we can deserve to accomplish it. Since you are two, then, quoth he, keep one another company as I, if I can, will do with my cousin Agraeus. Then gave he his horse and arms to Gandaline, and went on without fear as one who felt that never in deed or th in thought had he been faithless to his lady. When he came under the arch, the image began to sound far different and more melodious than he had ever done before, and showered down flowers his great fragrance from the mouth of the trumpet. The entrance had never been done before to any night ever connected. He passed on to the images, and here Agraeus, who apprehended something of his passion, met him and embraced him, and said, Sir, my cousin, there is no reason that we should henceforth conceal from each other our loves. But Amadis made no reply, but taking his hand, they went to survey the beauties of the garden. Don Galor and Florestan, who waited for them without, seeing that they tarried, besought Yuzanto, the governor, to shew them the forbidden chamber, and he led them towards the perrons. Sir brother, said Florestan, what will you do? Nothing, replied Galor, I have no mind to meddle with enchantments. Then amuse yourself here, quoth Florestan, I will try my fortune. He then committed himself to God, threw his shield before him, and proceeded sword in hand. When he entered the spell, he felt himself attacked on all sides with lances and swords, such blows, and so many that it might be thought never man could endure them. Yet, for he was strong and of good heart, he ceased not to make his way, striking manfully on all sides, and it felt in his hand as though he were striking armed men, and the sword did not cut. Thus struggling, he passed the copper perron, and advanced as far as the marble one, but there his strength failed him, and he fell like one dead, and was cast out beyond the line of the spell. When Galor saw this, he was displeased, and said, However little I like these things, I must take my share in the danger, and bidding the squires and the dwarf to stay by Florestan, and throw cold water in his face, he took his arms and commended himself to God, and advanced toward the forbidden chamber. Immediately the unseen blows fell upon him, but he went on and forced his way up to the marble perron, and there he stood, but when he advanced another step beyond, the blows came on him so heavy a load that he fell senseless, and was cast out like Florestan. Amadis and Agraeus were reading the new inscription in the jasper. This is Amadis of Gaul, the true lover, son to King Perion. When Ardian the dwarf came up to the line and cried out, Help, help, Sir Amadis, your brothers are slain. They hastened out to him and asked how it was. Sir, they attempted the forbidden chamber and did not achieve it and there they lie for dead. Immediately they rode towards them, and found them so handled as you have heard, albeit some little recovery. 
Then Agraez, who was stout of heart, alighted and went on as fast as he could to the forbidden chamber, striking a right and a left with his sword, but his strength did not suffice to bear the blows. He fell senseless between the perrons, and was cast out as his cousins had been. Then Amadis began to curse their journey thither, and said to Galor, who was now revived, Brother, I must not excuse my body from the danger which yours have undergone. Galor would have withheld him, but he took his arms and went on, praying God to help him. When he came to the line of the spell, there he paused for a moment and said, O Oriana, my lady, from you proceeds all my strength and courage. Remember me now at this time, when your dear remembrance is so needful to me. Then he went on. The blows fell thick upon him and hard till he reached the marble Haran. But then they came so fast as if all the knights in the world were besetting him, and such an uproar of voices arose as if the whole world were perishing. And he heard it said, If this knight should fail, there is not one in the world who can enter. But he ceased not to proceed, winning his way hardly, sometimes beaten down upon his hands, sometimes falling upon his knees. His sword fell from the hand, and though it hung by a thong from the wrist, he could not recover it. Yet holding on still, he reached the door of the chamber, and a hand came forth and took him by the hand to draw him in, and he heard a voice which said, Welcome is the knight who shall be lord here, because he passeth in prowess him who made the enchantment, and who hath no peer in his time. The hand that led him was large and hard, like the hand of an old man, and the arm was sleeved with green satin. As soon as he was within the chamber, it let go his hold, and was seen no more. And Amadis remained fresh, and with all his strength recovered, he took the shield from his neck, and the helmet from his head, and sheathed his sword, and gave thanks to his lady Oriana for this honor, which for her sake he had won. At this time they of the castle who had heard the voices resign the lordship, and seen Amadis enter, began to cry out, God be praised, we see accomplished what we have so long desired. When his brethren saw that he had achieved that wherein they had failed, they were exceedingly joyful, because of the great love they bore him and desired that they might be carried to the chamber, and there the governor with all his train went to Amadis, and kissed the hand as their lord. Then saw they the wonders which were in the chamber, the works of art and the treasures, such that they were amazed to see them. Yet all this was nothing to the chamber of Apollodon and Grimanessa, for that was such that not only could no one make the like, but no one could even imagine how it could be made. It was so devised, that they who were within could clearly see what was doing without, but from without nothing could be seen within. There they remained some time with great pleasure, the knights, because one of their lineage was found to, to exceed at worth all living men, and all who for a hundred years have lived, the islanders, because they trusted to be well ruled and made happy under such a lord, and even to master other lands. Sir, quoth Ysanjo, it is time to take food and rest for to-day. To-morrow the good men of the land will come and do homage to you. So that day they feasted in the palace, and the following day all the people assembled and did homage to Amadis as their lord, with great solemnities and feasting and rejoicing. You have heard in the first part of this great history how Oriana was moved to great anger and rage by what the dwarf had said to her concerning the broken sword, so that neither the wise counsels of Mabilia nor of the damsel of Denmark ought avail her. From that time she gave way to her wrath, so that wholly changing her accustomed manner of life, which was to be altogether in their company, she now forsook them, and for the most part chose to be alone devising how she might revenge herself for what she suffered, upon him who had caused her sufferings. So recollecting that she could by writing make him sensible of her displeasure, even at a distance, being alone in her chamber, she took ink and parchment from her carver, and wrote thus, My frantic grief, accompanied by so great a reason, causes my weak hand to declare what my sad heart cannot conceal against you the false and disloyal knight, Amadis of Gaul, for the disloyalty and faithlessness are known which you have committed against me. The most ill-fortuned and unhappy of all in the world 
since you have changed your affection for me, who loved you above all things, and have placed your love upon one who by her years cannot have discretion to know and love you. Since then I have no other vengeance in my power. I withdraw all that exceeding and misplaced love which I bore toward you. For great error would it be to love him who has forsaken me, when in requital for my sighs and passion I am deceived and deserted. Therefore, as the wrong is manifest, never appear before me, for be sure the great love I felt is turned into raging anger. Go and deceive some other poor woman as you deceived me with your treacherous words, for which no excuse will be received, while I lament with tears my own wretchedness, and so put an end to my life in unhappiness. Having thus written, she sealed the letter with the seal of Amadis, and wrote on the superscription, I am the damsel wounded through the heart with a sword, and you are he who wounded me. She then secretly called a squire, who was named Durin, and was brother to the damsel of Denmark, and bade him not rest until he had reached the kingdom of Sobardisa, where he would find Amadis, and she bade him mark the countenance of Amadis while he was reading the letter, and stay with him that day, but receive no answer from him if you wish to give one. Chapter 3 How Durin Went with the letter of Oriana to Amadis, and how when Amadis had seen the letter he abandoned everything in despair, and went to hide himself in the forest. Durin, in obedience to the command of Oriana, presently departed, and hasted so well that on the tenth day he arrived at Sobradisa, where he found the new queen Briolania, whom he thought the fairest woman, except Oriana, that he ever had seen and learning from her that Amadis had departed two days before, he followed him and reached the firm island just as Amadis was passing under the arch of true lovers, and so he beheld how the image did more for him than ever it had done for any other. And though he saw Amadis after he came forth to his brethren, yet he did not speak with him, nor give him the letter, till after he had entered the forbidden chamber, and been received by all as lord of the island. This he did by Gandalin's advice, who, knowing the letter to be from Oriana, feared that it might cause his master either to foreslow or fail in the achieving of so great an enterprise, for he would not only have left off the conquest of the firm island, but also of the whole world, to fulfill what she had commanded. But when everything was finished, Durham went before him, and Amadis took him apart from his brethren and from all others into a garden and asked him if he came from the court of King Lisuarte, and what tidings? Sir, said he, the court is as when you left it. I come from thence by the command of my lady Oriana. By this letter you will know the cause of my coming. Amadis took the letter, and he concealed the joy that was in his heart, that Durin might know nothing of his secret. But his grief he could not conceal when he had read those strong and bitter words, for neither his courage nor reason could support him then, for he seemed struck with death. When Durin saw him so disordered, he cursed himself and his ill fortune and death that had not overtaken him on the way. Amadis, for he could not stand, sate down upon the grass, and took the letter which had fallen from his hands, and when he saw the superscription, again his grief became so violent that Durin would have called his brethren, but feared to do so, observing what secrecy Amadis had chosen. Presently Amadis exclaimed, O Lord, wherefore does it please thee that I should perish, not having deserved it? And then again, Ah, of truth, an ill guerdon dost thou give him who never failed thee. Then he took the letter again, saying, You are the cause of my unhappy end, come here that it may be sooner, and he placed it in his bosom. He asked Durin if he had aught else to say, and hearing that he had not, replied, Well then, thou shalt take my answer. Sir, quoth him, I am forbidden to receive any. Did neither Mobilia nor thy sister bid thee say anything? They knew not my coming. My lady commanded me to conceal it from them. Holy Mary, help me. I see now my wretchedness is without remedy. He then went to a stream that proceeded from a fountain, and washed his face and eyes, and bade Durin call Gandalin, and bid him take Ysanjo, the governor, and he said to the governor, Promise me, as you are a loyal knight, to keep secret all that you shall see till after my brothers have heard mass tomorrow. 
and the same promise he exacted from the two squires. Then he commanded Ysandro to open privately the gate of the castle, and Gondolin take his horse and arms out privately also. This done they left him, and he remained alone, thinking upon a dream which he had dreamt the last night, wherein it seemed that being armed and on horseback he was on a hill covered with trees, and many persons round about him making great joy, when a man from amongst them presented him a box, saying, Sir, taste what I bring you, which he did, and it was exceeding bitter, and therewith feeling himself cast down and disconsolate, he loosed the reins of his horse, and let him go whither he would, and he thought that the mirth of all around him was changed into such sorrow as was pitiful to behold, but his horse carried him far away from them, and took him through the trees to a rocky place surrounded with water, and then it seemed in his dream that he left his horse in arms, as if by that he would have had rest, and there came to him an old man in a religious habit, and took him by the hand as if he had compassion, and spoke to him in a language which he did not understand, whereupon he awoke. Upon this dream Amadis now mused, thinking that he now found it true. Then hiding his face from his brethren, that they might not see his trouble, he went to the castle gate, which the sons of Isanio had opened. Come you with me, said Amadis to the governor, and let your sons remain here, and keep this matter secret. So they went to the foot of the rock, where there was a little chapel, and Gandalin and Durin went with them. There he armed himself, and asked the governor to what saint that chapel was dedicated. To Our Lady the Virgin, who hath wrought many miracles here. Hearing this, Amadis went in and knelt down, and said, weeping, Our Lady Virgin Mary, the consoler and helper of those that are afflicted, I beseech you to intercede with your glorious Son, that he may have mercy on me, and if it be your will not to help me in my body, have mercy on my soul in these my last days, for other thing than death I do not hope. He then called Isanyo, and said, promise as a loyal knight to do what I shall direct, and turning to Gondoline, he took him in the arms, and wept abundantly, and held him some while, for he could not speak. At length he said, My good friend Gondoline, you and I were nursed by the same milk, and our lives have been passed together, and have, never have I endured hardship and danger in which you had not your part also. Your father took me from the sea when I was so little, being only that knight's child, and they brought me up as a good father and mother bring up their beloved son. And you, my true friend, have always thought how to serve me, and I have hoped in God that he would one day enable me to requite thee. But now this misery, which is worse than death, is come upon me, and we must part, and I have nothing to leave thee except this island. I therefore command Isanyo and all others, by the homage which they have done to me, that so soon as they shall know my death, they take thee for their lord. The lordship shall be thine, but I enjoin that thy father and mother enjoy it while they live, and afterwards it shall remain to thee. This I do for what they did for my childhood, for my ill fortune will not suffer me to do what they deserve, and what I desire. He then told Isanyo to take from the rents of the island, which had accumulated enough to build a monastery by that chapel, in honor of the Virgin Mary, and to endow it for thirty friars. But Gondolin cried out, Sir, you never yet had trouble wherein I was separated from you, nor shall it be now, and if you die I do not wish to live, and I want no honors or lordships. Give it to your brethren, I will not take it, and I do not want it. Hold thy peace for God's sake, quoth Amadis, and say no more folly to displease me. My brethren, are of such worth that they can gain lands for themselves, and to bestow on others. Then he said to Isanyo, It grieves me, my friend Isanyo, to leave you before I could honor you according to your deserts, but I leave you with those who will do it. Isanyo answered, Let me go with you, sir, and suffer what you suffer. Friend, answered Amadis, it must be as I say, God only can comfort me. I will be guided by his mercy, and have no other company. He then said to Gondolin, If thou desirest knighthood, take thy arms, for since thou hast kept them so well, it is right they should be thine. I shall little need them. If not, my brother Galor shall knight thee. 
tell him this is Sanyo, and serve and love him as thou hast me for i love him above all my lineage because he is the best and hath ever been humble towards me tell him too that i should commit ardian the dwarf to his care they for great sorrow could make him no answer then amadis embraced them and commended them to god saying that he never thought to see them more and he forbade them to follow him and with that spurred his horse and rode away forgetting to take either shield or helmet or spear he struck into the mountain going whither his horse would thus he kept till midnight being utterly lost in thought the horse came then to a little stream of water and proceeded upward to find a place so deep that he could drink thereat the branches struck amadis in the face and so recalled him to himself and he looked round and seeing nothing but thickets rejoiced thinking that he was hidden in that solitude so he alighted and fastened his horse to a tree and sate upon the green herb by and wept till his head became giddy and he fell asleep End of chapter three